This is Amanda LaPlante. You're listening to Get Real to Heal on KWRH LP 92.9 FM. Get Real to Heal is underwritten by AFC Urgent Care at South Brentwood Boulevard and Litzinger. Urgent Care is in their name, but they also offer family care services. The next time your kids, spouse, or an elderly member of your family needs to see a physician, remember AFC Urgent Care. They're open beyond physicians' traditional office hours and will allow you to avoid a long, expensive visit to the ER if you don't absolutely have to. They can even do x-rays and lab tests in-house when needed. Visit AFC Urgent Care seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays and 8 to 5 on weekends, and you can check them out online at afcurgentcare.com slash Brentwood. Speaking of ER visits, I am very excited to have my very dear and longtime friend, Dr. Tina Bina. Dr. (laughs) Tina Bina it is. (laughs) Dr. Tina Bina, uh, MD. She is an ER doctor. out here in California now, but you've had, you've had quite an interesting career. I have. I've been to, I grew up in Kansas City. Um, I went to med school at UMKC, and then we, I went to um, residency at St. Louis University Hospital. You got to spend a lot of time in St. Louis. Um, and interestingly, my brother might be going to residency there as well. Yeah. It's a family um, affair. Your so father is My also. dad is also a physician. He's also a neurologist, so I got a lot of neurology growing up <laughs> and decided I don't want to do neurology because I had enough of it at home. <laughs> not not in there. All right. So, yeah. So, and then you, uh, let's see, you worked on Southside Chicago. Yes. Um, I chose to work at the Southside uh, Chicago, real Southside, where there's a lot of violence and a lot of, um, there's not just a lot of education there. And I felt like it made a big difference in that area. So that's one of the places that I wanted to go. Um, and I felt like I, you know, I, I helped a few people, and that's all I really wanted to do. Yeah, so. and, and of course now you're making a difference um, out in California. Yes. As where I am visiting now, um, and <laughs> you are working at. I am working at the VA now, and I actually really enjoy working at the VA. Um, it is a different kind of lifestyle. It has been taking a step back because I did work at a trauma center in Chicago, a level one trauma center in Chicago, and that was. You know, whole knife and gun club, but now I've taken a step back and I work at the VA in Long Beach. Um, and I really enjoy my experience there. It's uh, it, the vets are really amazing, they have amazing stories. I, I really wish that I had more time to sit and spend, you know, with the person themselves and so just focusing on their illness or what brought them to the ER. Um, just because if you, if you spend some time, they have some really good insights into life. And they really lived some incredible lives. I love that. I used to work with a, um, a fallen soldiers charity, and I just the veterans really they, they do. They're yeah. just amazing, amazing humans. They are, and we really owe them a lot. We wouldn't be sitting here in our comfortable homes without you know without sacrifice. their service and sacrifice. So I feel like if you really want to think of it, don't just say thank you. Please do say thank you, but also maybe do something. Donate to a charity that you find, or donate your time to. Um, to a VA and you know they're happy to have you and they're happy to see smiling faces that want to help. Yeah, make sure our veterans are appreciated, our soldiers are thanked, and the families are thanked as well. Because, yes, they um, put up with a lot. It's so hard to be away from your family for that long. You know, they go overseas for months or years sometimes at a time and sometimes with little or no communication. Right. Right. So what is it that you love about working in emergency medicine? Oh, I love emergency. I don't think I could work anywhere else except emergency medicine just because um, I like to try and put the pieces of the puzzle together, you know, and we, we get everything back right away in the emergency department. So it kind of helps us with the really sick patients that come through the emergency department. Um, however, the ER is also very limited in resources. So while the ER has the tools to help diagnose your acute and emergent conditions. It does not have like the long-term testing. So we only have like 10 or 12 lab tests that come back within an hour versus when you go to your primary care doctor, there are hundreds of tests that they can order. So each, each part has its place in the medical system, but I really love emergency medicine. I love really treating the acute um, emergent conditions and trying to help people when they most need us. So, and with the different experiences that you've had in emergency medicine, what, you know, what did you enjoy about, or 
Yeah, what did you enjoy about the other position that you had? I guess you said it was a knife and gun club, and it, it was, was a very a intense and, environment. It was a very intense environment. Was it just like this daily adrenaline? It, it was. It was daily adrenaline. It really was. Um, there's really no other way to describe it. It was just daily adrenaline. But, you know, all the ERs I worked at just had a really good team. So we would all just work together. The end goal being, of course, the best patient outcome or best patient care that we could provide. Um, but I think that was one of my favorite parts is that just as a team, we all just like banded together and like had one common goal. And I don't know, I just kind of loved it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. And I am a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. I like <laughs> jumping off of planes, I like, like skydiving and cliff jumping. So I think all, all ER doctors have like about a little bit. We enjoy that adrenaline rush. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I can't even imagine, and you definitely don't shy away from, I, I can't imagine someone walking in with, like, an arm at the wrong angle, or, yeah. like, you know, you know, bullet wounds, and things, the things that you see. Yeah, we've seen it all, and, you know, if we haven't seen it, we deal with it, we figure out a way to kind of just jump just in and jump get started. In. I think that's one of the things that I enjoy the most, too, is, like, I haven't seen it. Let me see what I can do. And so it's always like a learning experience. You never know what you're going to see instead of, I feel like, some of the other physicians that are some of the other physicians, um, they kind of see the same thing day, every day. And I, I like emergency medicine because you never know what you're going to see that day. <laughs> What's the strangest thing you've ever seen? Uh, that's such a difficult question because we've seen so many Toxins. So many things. Oh my gosh. I think, pay, like, oh, I'm going to skip that question for now. <laughs> I'll come back to it. We'll come back my, to that my, later. my mind flooded with so many stories oh. that I can't just pick, like, can't 10. Pick Not just even one. Pick, pick a couple. That's so funny. <laughs> well, okay. So, so for most people, though, it's not going to be a bullet wound or a, you know, whatever, right. like something really traumatic. For most people, they're going to the ER for. Um, pain related like various yeah. conditions but what can they expect when they go into the ER right so mo most people will end up as an ER patient at some point in their lives and so I think it's important to know kind of what to expect when you go into an ER um, it is going to be a long wait for the most part so make sure you bring a book mm -hmm. um, you get triaged uh, you'll usually go in um, and check in at a front desk where they triage you based on your complaint so in the emergency department, it's unfortunately not first come, first serve. So you might like see somebody that came in after you that goes in first and you'll be like, ah, oh, but I was here first. But that's unfortunately not how an ER works because we have to triage based on the severity of the complaint. So unfortunately, things like somebody having a heart attack will get seen before somebody having a rash and hopefully, and I hope you never have a heart attack, but hopefully... In that case, you get triage before them too. So that's kind of how the system works um, when you check in to see a patient. Um, and then when you are in an ER, um, it's important to know that we treat acute and emergent conditions, so life and limb threatening illnesses. So sometimes we don't get to a diagnosis, but that's a good thing. A lot of times you don't want our diagnoses because ours are pretty, you know, like one of your organs might not be working. So you kind of want all of them to work. <laughs> so um, not, not getting a diagnosis this, of the ER is it's not, not a bad thing. thing because okay. we don't have, so like if you come in with something like a stomach ache, uh, like your, your abdomen. Gosh, hurts. I wouldn't know anything about that. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but say you come in with abdominal pain, you know, it's the worst pain that you've had in to get evaluated in the ER, so please come in, get checked in, we'll evaluate you, we'll do a history, we'll do a physical exam, we'll sometimes run labs, we'll sometimes do a CT, depending on your complaint and your history. Um, but what we find is, well, is your pancreas working? Is your gallbladder working? Is there an infection somewhere? That's what we look at. But a lot of times we don't come to a diagnosis and either one of two things happens. Your body heals itself, which is what your body should do. It should heal itself. Um, but if you don't get better, then your primary care doctor can continue the workup that we started in the emergency department. And then if, you, if needed, can refer you to a specialist such as GI. But a lot of times we don't actually come up with an answer in the ER. What we come up with should be very reassuring that 
all of your organs are functioning fine and you know you'll survive to see another day <laughs> good thanks <laughs> so have have you so you've been on the doctor's side in the ER clearly yes. for yes. a very long time but have the tables ever turned have they flipped and have you been a patient in an ER I have I've been uh, a patient in the ER twice like I said everybody will go to an ER sometimes doctors are no exceptions we are humans as well um, so yes I have actually been an ER uh, patient twice at the ER that I worked at so I got to say hi to all my doctor friends <laughs> hi I'm here um, so once was actually for a kidney stone so those are incredibly That's painful. Terrible! Uh, I didn't know that so, you've been through that. So bad. I was uh, I was a resident, and it was just so painful, and I didn't know what was happening. I was like I was like in my twenties. I yeah, that's I like didn't even know people in their twenties had kidneys. I mean, like I actually did know people in their twenties had kidney stones, but not me. I was invincible <laughs> at twenty. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I was having a lot of pain and my, my dad took me and, you know, it doesn't matter how old you get, as long as you have pain and parents, you call them up, you're like, oh, I'm in pain and they like rush to your aid. Um, but yeah, I went to the ER for a kidney stone and they, that was very painful for a few days. Um, and then the second time I actually slipped and I fell and I broke my back also in my 20s and so it can happen to anybody at any age um but yeah that was a, a not fun experience <laughs> no well and i would think uh probably well breaking your back i would think would make anything difficult that's it was. a rather major and severe injury but right. especially with your particular profession that would be yes. really tough so um i was very fortunate i didn't have to take any like disability time and did a lot of at home kind of like rehabilitation. Um, but, and I also did work with physical and occupational therapy to mm -hmm. kind of help build up strength. Uh, because it's a very physical job as an ER doctor, right? It is. It is a very physical job. We help move patients over from an ambulance. We do things like CPR. We're walking around constantly. We're seeing people. We're bringing over to like examine. So it is. Uh, it is a physical job, I, I would say. It's not a stationary job. And also, actually, one of the things that I love about my job is that I don't just sit. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be hard for me, too. <laughs> Although, um, a lot of sitting, yeah. because everything is on the computer now. So, a lot of times, you look over, you'll see your doctor, and you're like, why are they just sitting there? It's because everything is on the computer now. So, yeah. all of our charting is on the computer. All of our labs come in on the computer. All of our radiology or imaging studies come in on the computer. So, we spend... A good amount of time at the computer too so yeah okay well yeah I know that's one of the things as a health coach that can be a little bit frustrating at times is that it is a lot of just sitting talking listening which is mm -hmm. amazing and I love the job but I've got to find a way to incorporate more movement yes so <laughs> anyway um all right so you did have this this uh you broke back you had this back injury mm -hmm. and so pain management is a great topic that we could touch on yeah. um because a lot of people really struggle with that yeah I feel like Everybody at some point in their life will also have some sort of, I, I would say a little more chronic pain issue that's lasting several weeks, several months, or maybe even their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to know that there are multiple tools out there to help with pain management. I think one of the first things people turn to is opioids. Um, and while I think opioids are a great tool in a short term, um, environment, whether it's three or maybe five days, I don't think um, opioids are a great long-term pain management because it's something that you'll be living with kind of long-term, so you should uh, at least explore other ways to deal with that pain. Um, when I broke my back, I really leaned heavily on you know, physical therapy and building and kind of just trying to push myself to the edge, but not over it because it's important to try and push yourself, but you don't, you want to listen to your body as well. And don't, if your body is really saying, no, don't do this, it's very important to try and listen to it and um, live it based on what your body says. Um, I can tell you a couple of experiences that I had with opioids. So um, when I broke my back, it was a pretty severe injury and I was in a lot of pain. I could barely get out of bed. I, in fact, I 
the mattress was too high on my bed. So I ended up just like putting, and even the, I had an air mattress, but that was like even too high for me. So I just put blankets on the ground and slept on the ground. Um, but to help deal with the pain, the doctor prescribed me Vicodin or Norco. Um, and I felt like my experience on that uh, medication was that I got so high that I no longer cared about the pain, but I felt like the pain was still there, um, which is not something that I wanted. Like, not, I just wanted yeah. to not feel pain, not, you know. Right, to be way. able to cope with the pain cope and not pain. feel that so yeah. much. So, but yeah, the, the side effects. The, the highness the high. that comes with that. Um, that's something that a lot of people don't want to yeah. deal with. So then I switched over, or I told my doctor, and he switched me over to, like, a Percocet. And then I was just asleep for, like, 8 to 10 hours. And I was like, I don't want this either. Like, it is nice that I finally got some sleep, sleep because good. I wasn't able to sleep. But this is, I, I would like to be up and functional. So for most of the time while my I had a broken back, um, I I was really just taking Motion and Tylenol, which you can actually take at the oh, same yeah. time, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't know. Um, but you have to be careful with like Motrin and Aleve; they're in the same class of medication. But Motrin and Tylenol are actually in different classes, so you can take those at the same time. And then I actually used a muscle relaxer, and I think that muscle relaxer, while it did make me sleep, but it didn't make me sleep nearly as long as the Percocet. Um, it actually helped relax those muscles so I could get up and moving. Um, but other pain management kind of avenues that people can explore, and I feel like some of this has to be done with the doctor's supervision. So, of course, please talk to your doctor before you, you know, embark on this journey because some things go with a broken back and some don't, and you have to be very careful with it. Um, so different things that can sometimes help different people are things like acupuncture. While I never got it myself, I have heard great things about it. Um, also things like cupping, but I think um, really working with a physical therapist that really kind of knows the body and body movements is the best way to quickly recover from a back injury. And I was actually back to work within two weeks of my injury. Wow. So yeah. you broke your back and you were back to work within two weeks of your injury with those modalities with those in modalities. place. Yeah. So that's amazing. Okay. So I was really lucky. I didn't have to take anything like disability. I just, you know, I worked with my physical therapist. I took minimal pain management. I think also when you take, you know, the less dose of pain management, it's really easy to come off and it's like, oh, well, I'll just not take Motrin today. But I feel like once you start getting more and more dependent on the heavier medications, it's harder and harder to break that habit because um, a little bit of pain becomes a lot of pain when you stop those kind of heavier medications such right. as uh, Percocet. Well, with the opioid epidemic that we have going on here, I'm sure that you see a lot of the ways that that can go wrong. So we do. We yeah. see. Um, I, I'm lucky I don't see it as much anymore, but when I was working in the Midwest, we saw a lot of opioid overdoses, and unfortunately, um, I personally know two people that overdosed on opioids, and I've watched it just kind of like destroy their families because, you know, they're young. One of them was in their 20s, died on New Year's Eve. And it was just a very sad day for all of us. Like we all heard on New Year's Day that he had passed from opioid overdose. Um, and then having to hear from his family and everything, it's just a very sad event that happens. And I feel like as we all grow older, go into the kind of this, this new world that we go into. Um, <laughs> Aging, <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. No, it's not about, but you yeah. know. <laughs> Um, we'll all know somebody that is affected by opioids, whether they're vocal about it or not, but we all, we'll all meet somebody that is struggling with some drug addiction or some, we'll meet somebody that has lost a family member or somebody they love from the opioid epidemic. So it is a real thing and I feel like at some point everybody will be affected, whether it's personally or through people that they know. And usually it starts benign. It usually starts with a real injury. It starts with 
I broke my bone or I had some sort of real injury where a doctor prescribed opioids and you know you need it like sure, some short term like tool. short term it it really you know it serves a purpose um, but like I said I feel like the more you use it the harder and harder it'll come off it'll be to come off so if you use it for one or two days it's not very difficult but you start using it for five days or seven days or a month or like two months then you start running into some trouble okay so what are some let, let's kind of switch it up to something maybe a little more positive a little more light, let's, lighthearted. yeah let's, let's empower <laughs> empower people with some some good information here so um things that people can learn about um that they can take out into life and be helpful in, in emergent situations sure um i think there are some really good skills that you know if you are at a restaurant um you can real and somebody maybe collapses there are a few things that you can do to help them Please don't go sticking a pen in anybody's neck. I know that's a big story that, like, I don't know. I read about it in the news. Yeah. They're like, hey, this doctor did this, like, treatment. Don't do anything heroic. So Wow. Okay. I think yeah, the, do, do not give do tracheotomies. Not, do not do that. If you're at the Italian restaurant. <laughs> someone chokes on, yeah, just, just tortellini. Just don't. Just don't. No trace. The best thing you can do in that situation is to call 911. <laughs> So either find somebody or do it yourself if you're the only one there and the first thing you should do is call 911 um, and have people that are medically trained and medical professionals come in, uh, come to that aid. Now, um, while you're waiting for uh, 911, a lot of times they will give you instructions of what to do on the phone. Um, please follow their instructions. They're very helpful. They're trained in this. Um, so, but if you notice that they aren't breathing, check for breathing, try and wake them up, say, hey, are you, like, you know, see if they wake see up. See if they're responding. See yeah. if they respond. If they don't respond, please feel for a pulse. If they don't have a pulse, we actually have hands only, or hands only CPR. And it's uh, where we only do CPR, so you don't have to worry about breaths anymore. Just start doing CPR. Um, hands are one over the other in the middle of the chest. They're hard and, and fast compressions. So we like to say CPR is not for the faint of heart. Sometimes things like ribs break. I've done CPR a number of times and I'm like, oh, and you just feel the ribs break. But like I said, CPR is not for the faint of heart. We really want a good compression of the heart um, when you do CPR. Um, and we do it to the song Staying Alive. <laughs> oh, no way. Yeah. Okay. So that, the, that was the Bee Gees how, saving lives. Yes. So okay. that is actually the the rate you should go for CPR. Is, That's is fantastic staying because alive. everyone knows that. Everybody beat. knows Every, staying alive. I don't yeah. know about the millennials, but yeah, they probably know staying alive. Okay. Well, we better get the millennials introduced we, to the Bee Gees pronto. Staying alive. So um, another thing. So and we're getting short on time, but the AED. Oh, machine. So um, we're starting to see those more. Yes. So the AEDs, I think, are such a great tool that are out in the community now. So in any crowded places, they have them, including planes and shopping malls. And they're so easy to use. There is like an instruction manual on it. So if somebody does pass out um, in front of you and they're unresponsive, um, see if that building has or see if that place where you're at has an AED. And basically, there are an instruction um, on the inside, but the biggest thing that I've seen that people do wrong is they forgot to turn it on. So make sure you turn it on. Okay. Um, there are two stickers that go on the chest. The placement is labeled in picture form on the AED machine. So we'll just place the stickers correctly. Um, they will, the machine actually analyzes the heart rhythm. So there are different rhythms that your heart can go into and um, it will provide a shock if needed. So it'll tell you a shock is advised, and if it is, they have you charge it and then sh clear. So you don't want to be touching the patient when the shock is delivered. So clear and then shock the patient, or else say shock is not advised. But it does save lives. Um, please use an AED if one is available. So important. All right, and then of course an EpiPen is another life-saving yes. 
instrument. Yeah. So especially there's been a sudden rise in food allergies um, that has been trended out by, I believe, the CDC. I would have to be quoted on that. Sure. But um, we have seen a rise in food allergies, and I'm glad there is a much more awareness to food allergies. Um, but one of the things is to know how to use an epi. Um, people with food allergies generally know because they get counseled on it, but also if you're out in the community, sometimes they're incapacitated and cannot use an EpiPen themselves. But I think it's important to know. Um, I think when you watch TV, they just take off the cap and like stab it in and it's all done, but that's actually not how an EpiPen works. So you want to clear a nice um, area in the middle of the, th the front of the thigh, insert a pen the pen into that area. Um, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds to, to deposit the medication, depending on the EpiPen. You can read the instructions on it. Usually they're very clear, um, but it is important to wait that 30 or 60 seconds. It does not get deposited instantaneously. Um, so just yeah. be sure to use it. Okay. Well, and so that might be one of the many things that probably drive you crazy when you watch TV. <laughs> it is. It is. One of the many things that drives me crazy when I watch TV is how they just like, how things are so instantaneous. So like the EpiPen, they just go, you know, they just put it in and it yeah. works immediately and their allergic reaction is cured, but that's not how it works. If you do use an EpiPen, you do have to go to a hospital um, because it is a heart medication as well. So you do need to usually be monitored for four to six hours and get further treatment if needed for your allergic reaction. So uh, not said on TV. <laughs> the other thing that really annoys me is that Whenever people flatline, we actually don't shock that rhythm. We don't um, get any paddles out or anything. We don't, uh, that rhythm is actually a not shockable rhythm. And we just do CPR for that in medications. Wow. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, that is less exciting <laughs> in TV land, but, but good to know. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show today yeah. and sharing this important information. Do you want to give a quick disclaimer? Okay. Uh, well, I just, just said that basically, yeah. you know, when you watch Get Real to Heal or you listen to Get Real to Heal, um, the doctors are so generous to come on here and share their information and knowledge. However, you should always go and see your own physician. Um, it's This show is not meant to replace any other medical advice that you'd be given by your own practitioner. Yep, yeah. I agree. Anything so, to add to that? No, I mean, yeah, if you have an injury or you're having pain, there's nothing better than a history and physical exam. So you it's really hard to give advice over the phone or whatever, so please go and see your physician or an ER or urgent care if, if needed or necessary. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, thank you to our underwriter, AFC Urgent Care, and Dr. Tina Pina. It's been a <laughs> pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad I could share some of the knowledge. <laughs> This has been Amanda LaPlante. You've been listening to Get Real to Heal on KWRHLP 92.9 FM. For more information from me, find me online at amandalaplante.com. And for this and other episodes of Get Real to Heal, check out soundcloud.com slash getrealtoheal or facebook.com slash getrealtoheal as well. And go make it a great day.